OK, looks like we're recording now, so uh, welcome everybody again. Uh, so this is our uh, discussion event on election uh, 2022. What's at stake and what to watch for? Um, and um, uh, we will uh, be uh, discussing the uh, 2022 elections in this panel discussion that's being hosted by the Department of Political Science and School of Education and Behavioral Sciences here at Middle Georgia State University. Uh, we're also co-sponsored by the uh, MGA Political Science Student Organization and the uh, Alpha Mu Zeta uh, chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the National Honors Honorary Society for Political Science. Um, so I uh, just want to talk uh, briefly about uh, some of our programs. For those of you who may not be familiar with our department, uh, we've got a bachelor's degree in political science, as well as uh, minors in political science, African and African diaspora studies, global studies, uh, pre-law environmental policy studies, and also a certificate in European Union studies, as well as the uh, Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies as well. So we have lots of different programs in our department, so hopefully um, one of those might be of some interest to you at some point in your academic career. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and uh, introduce our uh, panelists for today. Um, we have uh, Dr. John Hall, who's an associate professor of political science here at Middle Georgia State University, uh, joined us in uh, 2015, and his doctorate in political science is from Auburn University. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Matthew Caverly, who is a lecturer of political science, and I believe has been here at Middle Georgia State since January 2016. I believe that's correct. Um, and uh, his uh, doctorate in political science is from the University of Florida. Um, and rounding out our uh, all SAC crew um, is uh, I, myself. I'm Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm uh, the uh, an associate professor and the department chair of the Department of Political Science. I've been here at MJ since uh, 2012, um, and my doctorate is from Ole Miss or the University of Mississippi. Uh, looks like we're also joined by our uh, dean of the uh, School of Education and Behavioral Sciences. I don't know if um, he wanted to speak briefly. Um, I'm going to give him a very brief opportunity to uh, unmute and speak if he wants to. Yeah, uh, Dr. Lawrence, thanks. Um, and I will be very brief and just uh, literally thanking the panel and thanking you for putting this together. And, uh, you know, as we get further into the month of October, um, I can see almost nothing more important than what we're going to discuss tonight. So thank you again. OK, and thank you, Dr. Beek. So that was uh, Dr. David Beek, who's a, a professor of uh, psychology and also the dean of the School of Education and Behavioral Sciences and perhaps most importantly, my boss. So um, and our bosses, for that matter. Um, so um, before we uh, get started, I'll uh, talk about uh, our structure and a few ground rules and things like that. Um, so we're going to start with some questions that uh, I have uh, worked out in coordination with our uh, two uh, panelists um, and uh, we will also be accepting questions from the chat window so if you want to uh, post your questions in the chat window we'll try to get to those as we can uh, you're certainly welcome to ask multiple questions but uh, in the interest of giving everybody an opportunity to speak I do want to uh, stress that we'll try to uh, spread the wealth around a bit um, so if you do have lots of questions um, you may want to hold some of those towards the end um, but um, we will prioritize answering one question per audience member at the very least. Um, please be certain, uh, civil and courteous to each other in the chat window. I know that sometimes we can, um, in political discussions, be discussing things that are a little more um, controversial. And uh, I want to uh, stress that certainly controversy is a good thing, perhaps, but uh, nonetheless, um, you know, we avoid um, getting uh, too uh, personal in your discussions. Uh, criticize the ideas, not the person making the argument, that sort of thing, if if you feel the need to do so. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, we are, why is this not? There we go. OK. Um, so, so like I said, post your uh, questions in the chat. Order. I guess I already said that, didn't I? Oh, because we skipped a bad slide. That's why. OK. Um, so uh, as far as uh, our plans for our questions, uh, I'm going to um, go to these qu the questions I have one by one. This is just kind of an outline. Uh, matter of fact, I'll probably stop sharing so the video is actually a little uh, 
more focused on the uh, people discussing, but um, uh, some of the questions we'll be talking about today are uh, what are some of the major contests in the election? How do you register to vote? When and where can you vote? For those of you that are um, novices at this sort of thing, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then uh, two uh, particularly uh, prominent races we're definitely going to talk about are the uh, uh, contest here in Georgia for one of our two U.S. senators and also the Georgia governor's contest as well. Might talk about some other races as well, depending on audience questions and the interests of the panelists. But um, those are the uh, ones we're definitely going to focus on. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So let me uh, hit the uh, stop sharing button if I can figure out how to make it stop sharing. I'm not sure how to make it stop sharing. Um, uh, oh, there it is. Giant button says stop sharing. Um, is this an, um, so now it's just us. So um, so let's uh, go ahead and proceed to our first question, uh, which is for either panelists, uh, as always. Um, so what are uh, some of the major contests on the ballot in November, this uh, this November, uh, rather, and uh, here in Georgia and across the country? Well, I'll uh, jump in here first. Thank you, Chris, for that uh, introduction. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Beek, for being here with us. And I see several other uh, colleagues here uh, as attendees. Um, welcome to our second um, policy discussion. Uh, Dr. Lawrence did a great job of summarizing. And the first question is really the biggest question. This is what we could spend the rest of the night on. What are the big races coming down the pipe here in the midterms? Um, first and foremost, going looking at it from the perspective of Georgia, we have a gubernatorial race here that is of significance. Uh, we have two candidates, one incumbent governor, uh, Republican Governor Kemp, and the other Democratic uh, candidate, Stacey Abrams, who was once uh, who served a, a little over a decade in the Georgia uh, House of Representatives, served as the minority leader for several of those years. And in 2018, the two candidates fought to one of the closest races you can possibly have in Georgia. Uh, Governor Kemp won with, I believe, something in the realm of 55,000 votes, which sounds like a lot, but in a state with over 10 million people like Georgia, that was close. Uh, and they are back for round two. So one of the most important will be the gubernatorial race in Georgia. Uh, there are, I think, like 36 other gubernatorial elections that we can talk about throughout the night. We also have to look at, from the perspective of Georgia, the U.S. Senate, uh, where we will have incumbent U.S. Senator, a statistical anomaly, historically, a Democrat in uh, Raphael Warnock, who will be going up against Herschel Walker, who played football for the Georgia Bulldogs and went on to the NFL. Uh, that race is actually quite close, although the most recent data I've seen does have uh, current Senator Warnock uh, stretching ahead with roughly a two-point lead, but that can change dramatically. Um, we also have a, a number of other elections that we will get to tonight. Uh, right out of the gates, because of the breadth of this particular question, I'm going to purposefully slow myself down from going into U.S. Senate seats and other gubernatorial elections so we can get to that later. But I'll turn it over to Matt to fill in any blanks that he saw because I left a lot of blanks. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, so, uh, well, first of all, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for attending our our discussion here this evening. Uh, so, of course, as, as uh, Georgians, um, um, what uh, Professor Hall addressed there is is the the biggest thing. Um, but I, I'd like to us all to think a little bit about uh, at the national level, um, because. Uh, the midterm elections um, have become increasingly nationalized, uh, and this has been the rise of, uh, uh, of, for starters, the way our media covers politics, but uh, is a reflection of that. But it's also been a rise of sort of the uh, resurgence of, uh, of uh, political parties uh, as a um, candidate servicing organizations and and hubs for nationalized campaigns uh, and that's very much going on and so when we talk about a race involving the senate or the governorship in georgia what we're actually also talking about is the basic conflict at the national level between the democratic and the republican parties um, the 
the electorate is so closely divided that uh, uh, at this moment in time, I could tell you that both the House and the Senate are potentially up for grabs. Now, the, the House and the Senate are currently under the control of the Democratic Party. But uh, if you if you look at the at the polling and and uh, um, the funds and the the uh, monies that are being spent, uh, raised and spent, um, what you very quickly find is that uh, this could be this could potentially be anybody's victory, almost regardless of what happens here in Georgia. So I just want people to keep in mind that what's going on in Georgia is really part of a of, of a of a national contest. And it's also and I'm, I'll close with this and then and, as a, this is an early runner of uh, of the presidential election, quite frankly, uh, as midterm elections um, have long been. Uh, they're seen as referendums on the incumbent president's party. Historically, they tend to lose seats uh, in the Congress. That's especially manifested in the House if you look at the empirical patterns over time. But um, this is uh, this is going to be a, a it, this is an early run. Uh, so we're going to see a test uh, across the country of some of um, uh, former President Trump's um, uh, backed candidates uh, about how well they're going to do, uh, which might lead something to do with him. Uh, because, of course, he's out in the uh, he's uh, still very much a factor in Republican Party politics and for that matter, presidential politics. Uh, and of course, this is also a part of, of President Biden. Uh, President Biden has had some uh, a fair amount of legislative successes in recent months. And um, but yet, if you look at his approval ratings, uh, they're not really manifested in that. So. Uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting night, uh, regardless of what happens. But it's very much I'd like people to think about it as, as there are national elements to this, and there, and there are presidential elements to this. And now I'm going to shut up. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so, um, so kind of more of a mechanical question. Uh, I decided that since we had a bunch of uh, young people here that may not have ever voted before, uh, it makes sense to ask a couple of these questions. Uh, so first question is, um, as they've probably been told already in their American government classes or uh, at some point in their lives, um, you know, that, um, you know, to be able to vote, you need to register to vote. So the question would be, how do you do that? How do you how do you get registered to vote and how does that vary? Uh, between states, so uh, we may have some people that are not from Georgia here, and so the process might be a little different for them. Great question, Matt. I didn't want to jump in front of you here. Um, very quickly to summarize, how do you get registered to vote? The good news, it's incredibly easy. The bad news, that outside of a handful of American states, it's not automatic. Um, everything you need to be registered to vote in the state of Georgia I don't know what you know about, and this is to all the students, I don't know what you know about your relationship with the state of Georgia, but it's a lot more intimate than you might think. The state of Georgia knows your driver's license number. The state of Georgia knows where you live. The state of Georgia knows where you work. They know your phone number. They know your date of birth. They have all of this information. Having said that, um, in Georgia, you can register online. Uh, you can register in person. You can register by mail. Basically, if you have access to a computer, you can go to the Secretary of State's uh, website. You don't even have to do that. All you have to do is Google, how do I register to vote in Georgia? And it will take you straight there. And you can check to see if you're still registered or already registered. What you need is your driver's license or another state issued license. You need your date of birth. You need a name. You need an address. And that's about it. Again, the state of Georgia already has this data, but they're going to require you to ask to, to give it to them and ask to be registered. So how do we get registered? Very simple. Online is the simplest you can imagine. If you do this by mail, you are going to be providing the exact same information and sending it in. And you could also do it in person at your local voter registrar's office. Having said that, when it comes to registration, there are a number of states, particularly actually the entire West Coast, automatically registers voters. That is a way of encouraging uh, the electorate to get out to vote. Some states don't necessarily go out of their way to do everything possible to make it as easy as possible. Having said that, it's not that hard. Is the fact that you may live in a state that doesn't automatically register to vote, does that fact 
make it impossible for you to vote? No. Does it add one more hurdle that might be just annoying enough for you to skip out on voting? Maybe. So to summarize, that's how you get registered to vote. It is overwhelmingly easy. And I'll turn it over to Matt for Chris. Uh, well, I'll just jump in here. Uh, so I, I went around and I, I, I poked around. Um, and so uh, for if anybody uh, is interested out there, uh, if anybody's interested out, so the actual website, the address is georgia.gov forward slash register dash vote. And so if you, you put that in there, that's going to take you to the Secretary of State's um, web page. And uh, and it'll answer questions uh, that you have about about registering to vote. Um, the so political scientists over time have spent a lot of uh, a lot of, a lot of ink on this sort of thing. And one of the things that 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 they've done in studies that they found is that while uh, Professor Hall is absolutely right, it's uh, it's it's actually fairly easy. As long as you know the process to register to vote. Now, note what I just added on there that I said, as long as you know the process. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, but what most of, a lot of studies have found in political science is that the more difficult you make it to do something in politics, the less likely it is that people are going to do it. They've also found empirical studies have found over time that. There's a sort of asymmetry about how this impacts. Um, there are people who probably, no matter how many obstacles you put in front of them, they're going to come out and vote. And then there are people who, if it rains on election day, uh, it's a crapshoot whether they're going to show up. There's a partisan differentiation between how those people their patterns in, in political participation. The people that, if you will, are, and I don't mean this in a normative way, but I'm just saying that I'll just call them the better quality voters. And I don't mean that they're, they're not better people. They're, everybody's the same. But they're, they're somebody that, if you're a politician, you say, well, can I count, can I count on, on Chris Lawrence and John Hall to come out on election day? Well, Overwhelmingly, actually, I would probably be able to with those two guys. But the the pattern is that um, the Republican Party, Republican voters tend to show up more, uh, no matter what the conditions are. Uh, they and the the harder you make it to vote, uh, if you will. The voters that that mostly impacts now, not entirely, but mostly are people on the political left. So it hurts Democrats and it helps Republicans. So that's that's what the patterns indicate. Now, I, I do want to say there might be some change in that. I just I don't just to throw a little cold water on my own little finding there. Um, as the Republican Party has increased its voter support among uh, the white working class, they might be developing some, they might over time develop some of the same difficulties that the Democrats have with some of their coalitions. So that, but that's, that's very speculative uh, at this moment in time. But anyway, I just want to throw that out there. That was, I, I took us off in the weeds a little bit, but I just wanted to throw that out there about, um, uh, about ready vote. And by the way, before I turn over, I actually also looked up, there is a whole bunch of interest groups out there that have uh, specific information to help you to get registered. And so I'll just read off a list of a few of them. There's a group called Democracy Works, the League of Women Voters. They have a Vote 411 initiative. You go to that Vote 411 and it'll tell you where to go and how to go. You could put in your state and your day. Um, the American Legion has a get out the vote uh, bunch. There's Rock the Vote. Uh, if anybody in here is a little bit older, particularly the, the professors on there, um, even the dean might might remember to rock the vote from the MTV days. Um, there's Forward Justice. Um, there is uh, Fair Fight. Fair Fight, by the way, is Stacey Abrams' uh, organization. Uh, um, the Legal Defense Fund. So these things that ma are manifested, uh, there are certain religious organizations 
um, and on both the left and the right that also provide out information on voting. And so uh, there's lots of places to go. Just Google around and, and find out and, uh, and, and go do your, well, I'll just close out by saying this, uh, voting is a right. Voting is a right, but uh, I would hope that all of you over time would start to think about voting as a duty. That is an obligation. Uh, if you live, if you're, if you're an American, uh, it is the most important thing that we can do as citizens to influence our own governing. And now, once again, I will shut up. <laughs> Great point, sir, Matt. It occurred to me, I want to throw this out. I did not talk at all about requirements. These are somewhat intuitive, but just to double check and make sure we go over them, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Non-U.S. citizens can't vote. You have to be an actual resident. You also have to be at least 17 and a half when you are registering. You have to be 18 on the day of the election. Um, depending on the state, your status as a non uh, as a felon uh, in Georgia, you can be re-enfranchised once you're out of prison unless your felony that you were convicted for involved moral turpitude. Um, also, you can't be found to be mentally incompetent by a judge. So depending on the state in which you live, you're going to see some differences there, but definitely a U.S. citizen, 18 the day you vote, and in Georgia, a non-felon, unless you were involved in turpitude. Uh, there are a number of states that allow you to vote when you get out of prison, some require you to be out of prison, off of parole, completely out of the criminal justice system. Three states actually don't take away the franchise at all. You can vote from prison. Um, but those are some other basic points there. And I'll stop talking again. OK, thank you, Matt. And thank you, John, John both for uh, a lot of important and useful details there. Um, so kind of related to that is, you know, once once you're registered to vote, which, by the way, the deadline for that here in Georgia is next Tuesday. So if you do plan to register to vote, you do need to be registered on or before the 11th of October um, because the 10th is a holiday, even though we don't get the holiday. But nonetheless, um, uh, I guess voter registration offices do get the holiday. So um, so do make sure you if you do plan to vote in uh, November, you're registered by the 11th. Uh, and again, that's something that can vary by state. So there are some states where the registration deadline might be a little bit earlier, and certainly there are some states where the registration deadline might be a little bit later. So if you're not in Georgia, um, you should check your uh, uh, state websites. And I posted a couple of those in the chat, uh, or at least sites where you can find that information in the chat. Um, so related to that, um, once you're registered to vote, um, the question arises, where and when can you vote? And how might I or how might the hypothetical voter in the audience uh, find that out? I'll jump on this again, and I cannot stress this enough. Obviously, we vote on election day, um, which will be one month after the, well, a little less than a month after the 11th. Um, I can't stress enough the joy of early voting. You can skip out on lines. You can get your voting done. In Georgia, I believe it's October 7th. Through November 4th, you can participate in early voting. Each county has what, at least one site uh, where you can go in and early vote in person. Um, highly recommend that. Very stress free. In addition, uh, this is something that we all became much more familiar with during the pandemic. Uh, not only did we have a pandemic in 2020, we had it during an election year, a presidential election year. We now have an expansion on what has always been called absentee voting. We now call it mail in voting. Um, however, there have been some changes in Georgia. Uh, you can vote early, as I just said. You can absentee or mail-in vote, uh, available to all Georgians. Uh, the only difference is now, instead of 2020, you have to request that mail-in voting information. Uh, you also, due to recent legislative reforms, have to show ID, uh, voter ID requirements in order to get those absentee ballots. Um, you can also take your mail-in ballots or, uh, and you can drop them off at ballot boxes throughout the state. Other changes to election law have limited the number of those boxes that we have. Each county must have at least one. This does present some problems when you have a geographically large county that might have one ballot box that you can drop off. So these are some reforms that we are, we're gonna be experiencing in real time. Um, a few other changes. In the past, you could request absentee ballots 180 days before the election, I think that's been limited now to just under 80 days. Um, so early voting, 
recommend it highly. Uh, Mail-in voting, recommend that highly. If you are possibly leaning in the direction of a little lazy that day and don't want to go stand in a line. And then, of course, there's in-person voting on Election Day. In Georgia, it's from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So those are the three main ways you can vote. Vote early, vote absentee or mail-in, vote on the day of the election. And I'll uh, leave it at that. Oh, I don't I don't really have anything to to add on too much on that other other than um, uh, uh, particularly the absentee um, voting, mail in voting uh, and um, uh, uh, early voting are uh, of particular interest, I think, to college students, uh, because in many, many cases, college students uh, might not be able to get back home to cast their ballot uh, in time. And, and especially, uh, although I think the truth of the matter is, I think most instructors, lecturers, professors uh, would be pretty lenient when you push came to shove, because we, we tend to be people that want people to vote. <laughs> but uh, but potentially, uh, I realize, you know, some of the one of the things that has caused a decrease in voter turnout over the years has been things like this. If you notice the election day, which by the way, I looked up on the on the calendar is uh, November the 8th. Um, November the 8th is like our election days are on Tuesdays. Well, this may not be as important for the college students in the room, but uh, most of us who work in jobs, we know that uh, we have to be in work. Uh, and so one of the things that has deterred voting on Election Day has been people who just can't get off work uh, in some states where they close the the uh, the polls really early. Uh, now, Georgia's does pretty good. We up to 7 p.m., but there are states that shut it down at like 4 p.m. Well, you might not even be off work at that time. Now, again, uh, a lot of. I would argue employers that are. Uh, I would say good employers will give people time off to do it, but that doesn't always happen. So anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and that leads you to think, well, why would they have rules like that? And that's something to think about. Matt, great point. I wanted to point out, I forgot the name of the legislation, but there is federal law that requires that your employer give you time to get off work and vote on election day. Having said that, you make great points in terms of the inconvenience. And if anyone here has ever had a job and a boss especially a busy job, while you have the federal right to get off work to go vote that day, Matt, as Matt was uh, saying, it's inconvenient. Um, so even though you have a federal, even though you have the, the right to go, in many instances, the reality of the work day is such that it can be a huge uh, preventative uh, in terms of voting. Most liberal democracies on the planet Earth, we've covered this in class for any of my students, we'll cover it more later, have voter holidays or they vote on the weekends. We vote on Tuesday. We do not have a national voter holiday. Many of the liberal democracies of the planet Earth automatically register their voters to vote when they're of age to vote. We do not have that as a federal law. There are a number of things that the state and or federal government could do that would make it easier to vote. Many states do not do that. As Matt suggested there, I will leave it to you to figure out why that is. It's because in many instances, they don't necessarily want absolutely everyone to vote. There is no alternative to that. And there are political realities to that that uh, Dr. Cavalier pointed out earlier. Uh, Republicans vote better than Democrats. Um, as of the 2020 election, that's the last data I confirmed, there are more Democrats than there are Republicans. I've had several students when we talk about this ask, well, why isn't, why aren't all 435 Congress persons and all senators and all governor, why isn't everyone a Democrat? Because Republicans vote better than Democrats. If you were a strategist for any political party. This is neither Democrat nor Republican. There are reasons to possibly slow down that vote based on these political realities. So I'll leave it at that. Great summary there, Matt. OK, thank you, thank you know, both again. And uh, yeah, one, one additional point I might, I might add on the um, uh, question of uh, voting on Election Day and uh, getting off work is um, it, it's also not paid time off, right? So, yeah. um, you know, if you're trying to, you know, if you're somebody that's struggling to, you know, make ends meet or something like that, right? Two hours of work 
you know, that's two hours you're not getting paid. And mm-hmm. so, um, and the other thing is, um, the other thing I would say about early voting is, you know, it, it it's going to let you vote on your terms as opposed to, you know, you may not know what's going to come up on um, the uh, election day, right? And so, um, it would probably make sense, you know, particularly if you're somebody that works somewhere that doesn't, you know, kind of has kind of an ebb and flow, and you don't know if it's going to be busy or not. Um, you know, maybe you luck out and it's not a busy day, but maybe it is a busy day. And so, um, you know, being able to plan around that early voting period, um, you know, might make things a little easier or, you know, take advantage of an absentee ballot or something like that may, might make sense as well. You know, I I almost always vote early just because, you know, I don't know how long the line's going to be on election day, right? And so, um, whereas I can probably find some time, you know, early, uh, you know, in that early voting period where I know that I can block off some time and be sure that, okay, you know, it's, um, you know, going to work for me. So, um, but that's just me, you know. Uh, there are some people that want to wait until the election day. I, I have colleagues that you know believe very strongly, and you know um, I I want to vote on election day because that's what they do. It's their civic holiday, if you will, right? So, um, and I'm not going to uh, begrudge them that. Um, let's see, and and we also posted the that website for the uh, Georgia Secretary of State that I posted the website uh, for. Uh, that will also work if you're already registered to vote. It will tell you. Um, where you need to vote, so where your regular polling place is. It um, has information on uh, early voting sites, uh, has information on uh, how to request an absentee ballot, has informa- it gives you a copy of your sample ballot. So, you know, it's all there. You just have to go and look it up, basically. Um, and all you need is your first name, your last name, uh, your date of birth, and what county you live in, um, or what county you're registered in. So, um, so it's pretty straightforward, um, but you do have to do it. Um, and you should have also got a postcard in the mail at some point in the last year or so that has that information, at least for your regular voting site as well. Um, before we move on to the next question, just want to uh, thank a couple of our other guests, uh, Dr. Matrock and Dr. Svanovic, who are joining us as well. I wanted to appreciate uh, them coming out to join us. Um, you know, they don't, they're not under any obligation to speak or ask questions or anything like that, but I did want to um, uh, thank them for joining us as well as thanking all of you. We're up to about 50 or so people in the audience and participants. That's uh, uh, pretty close to a record for us, I think. I think we had one with like 70 or so, but um, we're um, 50 is a good number for us. So uh, we appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening um, or afternoon or whatever this is. I guess we're still, we're kind of in the, the gray zone there. Um, so let's move on to some more um, uh, immediate questions, perhaps. Um, and um, you know, I thought about the the order of these, uh, and I, I think if you'd asked me last week what order I was going to ask in, I think I would have asked about the governor's race first. Um, but uh, we've had some interesting developments in the Senate contest, and so um, perhaps making things a little more interesting or at least a little more spicy. Um, and that is. Um, you know, there's a bit of a, a tight race uh, between the incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock and uh, his Republican challenger, Herschel Walker, uh, who we've uh, mentioned already. Um, what are the major issues in the contest? Well, what, what's really dividing um, Warnock and Walker as far as what they're promising to do in office, what the impact of uh, voting for them would be, that sort of thing. And uh, just to... Um, Set this up a little. We I have a separate question about uh, some of the developments that have come up uh, in recent days. So, um, so I, I'll, for this question, I want to kind of focus more on just kind of what you know what what are the issue positions distinguishing the two candidates, and why why would somebody want to vote for one or the other if they were voting based on the issues, voting on you know like abortion or you know something like that. Man, I didn't want to jump on the first one every time. Oh, okay. Gonna... All right, John. No, no, I'll, go, yeah. I'll go ahead and take it this way. Oh, uh, by the way, before I, I get going here, uh, again, if you if you go to the um, the Secretary of State website, they have a wonderful calendar, a schedule of events, or of elections, that gives you all of the dates with the deadlines in it uh, related to reg- for everything from registration to uh, voting, uh, t- 
times to vote, when to start the uh, uh, early voting, and then all of that. So it's just a, a wonderful reference uh, to look at. All right, so uh, addressing, uh, trying to address anyway, the issues um, that have, have come up here. Uh, so Senator Warnock um, uh, has uh, really pushed, re from the time that he ran uh, through his time as senator, uh, he's really pushed um, um, voting rights, particularly uh, access, ballot access, um, and has pushed against some of the movements of um, the, uh, actually the Georgia General Assembly, which is dominated by the, uh, the other party, by the Republican Party, uh, to adjust those uh, access things. Um, and so that's been a, a major um, a personal uh, issue for him um, and um, that he has really put up. Another great uh, issue that he has uh, uh, tied himself into um, uh, has been the, um, the reaction to the Dobbs decision that um, um, undid Roe. Uh, and so uh, sort of moved the abortion issue back to the states. Uh, and Warnock has uh, has um, come out in favor. He's been tying um, uh, this to, to uh, women's rights and so on and so forth. Uh, and even how this is associated with uh, with uh, civil rights more generally. Um, so uh, the. Um, uh, of course, uh, this. This is an. Remember, I said before we had the issue of uh, of a nationalization of elections, and of midterm elections. This is actually a, a manifestation of this because a lot of this comes back to um, reactions to uh, the fallout from the 2020 election. And so, one thing, uh, Mr. Walker um, is a. Uh, he was. Um, uh, tied at the hip, so to speak, uh, and it is run as a, he is a, a President Trump, former President Trump preferred candidate. Um, so uh, Trump backed him uh, in the primary and uh, is now backing him in the general election uh, and, and uh, raising money for him and so on. So again, what if we want to think about this, what is this? Um, why would President Trump involve himself in this? Well, one potential idea out there might be that perhaps President Trump wants to be president again. And uh, and uh, this is a um, an early run because remember, part of the reason why he is no longer president is because of um, things that happened in Georgia. So uh, the this election um, is very much uh, tied up into these national issues. Um, and uh, and also into these other issues, another area, and then I'll, I'll leave on this, but Warnock has also been very associated with um, some of the movement against um, um, the racial profiling or accusation of racial profiling in uh, criminal, criminal uh, justice policies uh, and in policing policies. And uh, so Warnock has, has uh, worked within that. Now, uh, Mr. Walker, um, uh, Walker has not been as um, policy substantive in orientation. Uh, he's been more of a um, um, vote for me. Uh, you know, I'm a conservative and 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 that sort of thing. So uh, I think I'll leave. I'll, I think I'll leave this over to John to take over um, uh, on um, the rest of this. Great summary, Matt. Not much to add. Um, the major differences. Um, the incumbent Senator Warnock is a Democrat. Herschel Walker is running as a Republican and all that that brings with it. If you are in favor of women's rights, you will be looking at Warnock. Uh, if you are in favor of prohibiting abortion, you would probably be in favor of Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker has actually come out with a relatively aggressive stance on um, abortion rights, saying just recently that uh, he does not believe in any exceptions for uh, a woman's right to abortion. They should be banned in all cases. So one is a classic base Democrat. The other is, uh, at least in terms of the policies that we have heard him talk about, Matt made a good point there. He has not been very policy specific. Um, hasn't been very visible. There are some differences here. Um, 
if you're in favor of potential uh, gun control policies, you would be looking at Warnock as opposed to Herschel Walker. Overall, the major differences have been in the fact that there is a degree, not a degree, there is an extraordinary amount of inexperience on the part of Herschel Walker, not just in politics. He isn't dipping his toe into the shallow end of the political pool. He is running for U.S. Senate. Um, so it is an extraordinarily large arena that he's stepping out into. And so far, the major difference I would see would be less policy specific um, ad campaigns, uh, less less publicity. The Herschel Walker has really not uh, been in the public eye a great deal. Uh, we do now officially have one scheduled debate between Senator Warnock and Herschel Walker in Savannah. Um, the Warnock camp wanted, I think, at first four. The Walker camp has now agreed to one. So there are some significant differences between these candidates. But in terms of the differences politically, one's a Democrat, one's a Republican. What this could mean, it could mean very similar. It could have similar ramifications to the 2020 election. Who controls the U.S. Senate? I don't think it's going to come down to Georgia. We'll talk about this later. I'm expecting something big to happen in Pennsylvania and Ohio, maybe North Carolina regarding the U.S. Senate. But we'll talk about that later. But in terms of the importance of this campaign, one's a Democrat, one's a Republican. OK, thanks. Um, so to kind of follow up on that, as I kind of alluded to before, um, there's been a bit of a, I guess, the classic October surprise here. Um, maybe more to come. We'll see. But there's definitely been one already, and that is that allegations have surfaced that uh, Herschel Walker paid for a former girlfriend to have an abortion in 2009. And that one of those, um, I guess, as that story was breaking, uh, one of his children, um, Christian Walker has gone on record on videos, posted to social media, including Twitter, um, accusing his father of threatening and violent behavior towards his mother and some siblings. Um, what impact, if any, uh, do you think that this uh, uh, revelation or these stories uh, may have on the contest? That's a great question. We A lot of what we're looking at are allegations. Do that, do with that what you will. In the realm of politics, I know exactly what we're going to do with that. Allegations of this magnitude, allegations that have been backed up again by multiple family members, have a huge impact. Um, right out of the gates, I want to say this. When looking at the horrifying accusations of uh, domestic violence, of threatening a spouse with a gun, of threatening to murder a spouse, there are diehard I would argue definitely Trump Republican voters in Georgia, it's not gonna matter at all. There are diehard Democratic voters in Georgia, that's not gonna matter at all. It's with those independent voters in the middle, that's where this is all gonna play out. We're seeing some relatively unprecedented ad campaigns in Georgia right now. On the one hand, it's because of the horrifying nature of the accusations against Herschel Walker, but I don't know if everyone's seen this yet, the commercial that actually has uh, images of a gun being placed at the head of a woman in the and the, the, the police report that his wife had made, this is horrifying. And it may have the effect of turning independent, possibly even Republican female voters into the camp of Raphael Warnock. If you combine the possibility of domestic violence plus the Dobbs opinion that has completely removed the constitutional guarantee of a woman to an abortion that had been covered under the substantive due process right of privacy, that could push an incredibly important demographic, the female relatively center line voter. Um, on that note, most recently, you had mentioned uh, there are now accusations that Herschel Walker had paid for the abortion of a female friend. I'm thinking girlfriend. I don't know any details beyond that. But it's important we see accusations like this. On the one hand, outside of the political spectrum, depending on how you feel about abortion, but just in general, you could look at a male, biological male, helping a biological female have an abortion that he caused the need for. You could look at that as responsible. In politics, that's not how that's gonna be interpreted. He's a Republican. He has publicly said he does not want women to have access to an abortion. And if that's your opinion, that's your opinion, no judgment. The fact that he may have actually paid for an abortion would be horrifying. But again, for those diehard Republican core voters, it won't matter. For the diehard Democratic voters, it won't matter. But for those in the middle, it could matter a great deal. So we'll see how that pans out 
over the next month and a couple of days. Um, beyond that, I'll turn over to Matt. That's my quick assessment of that. Oh, well, I don't have uh, too much to add. I thought that was very good. Uh, the the only uh, the only thing I might say is that there's a uh, so if the election remains close between these two, uh, which right now is close, uh, if it remains close, then a slight change in turnout. Uh, if um, uh, um, Professor Hall's assessment is correct. This could cause a slight decrease in the turnout on behalf of Walker. That's all Warnock would need to win. Uh, that's it. Because uh, just remember, uh, he spoke about the, the gubernatorial election in 2018 that was decided by 55,000 votes. Uh, you don't need much. Uh, if you think about the presidential election here in Georgia, I want to say I think it was Biden won Georgia by like 12,000 votes. 12,000 votes in, a, in an electorate that's millions large is that's nothing. I mean, that's that's a that's a difference between, you know, five minutes across polling stations. Uh, uh, so it this is um, if this turns out, it could have a have an impact. Um, now, again, though. Remember, the Republicans tend to come out more and they tend to stay with their guy or their gal more. Uh, so Walker might have enough embedded support that could work against that. But but it, I think it remains to be said. I think a lot of it will really come down to as um, how much the media um, really stamps down on this uh, and how much we hear of this in the next month. Uh, and what I mean by the media is I don't just mean, obviously, the the liberal side of the media is going to beat them up. But remember that people who are Republicans, they're not watching MSNBC anyway, so it doesn't matter. But if it creeps into, you know, if you get some of the evangelicals, uh, um, you know, somebody talking about on, on a, a Trinity Broadcasting Network or something, Talking about, you know, if Huckabee comes, Governor, oh, former Governor Huckabee mentions, you know, something about that, uh, about something like this, uh, which a spousal abuse that could cause. Uh, and, and a thing about abortion that could be, you know, because if you, you know, you could get you could get Walker on not being true to his principles. But again, it comes down to it. Will it will it have an impact? Uh, I think it remains to be seen, but uh, it. All it needs to have is a very small impact to cause the election to go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So that's important to understand on a very tight electorate like that. Thank you. I agree, Matt. Um, really quick, I think at the end of the day, the most important uh, event, my light keeps going out, um, I'm not moving enough, is going to be Savannah. In Savannah, you are going to have on a stage, televised, Senator Raphael Warnock with civilian Herschel Walker and I think a lot of important things will happen there. Um, not, you either have the experience of going before a national audience answering very difficult questions or you don't. Nothing against Herschel Walker, nothing against anyone voting for him. This is totally apolitical. He's had some problems so far with public appearances. Um, it's not accidental that he is not aggressively seeking public events. It's not accidental that he purposefully wanted one debate, not more than one. So I think that debate in Savannah is going to pretty much wrap things up outside of any other surprises. Warnock is a much better and seasoned public speaker than, than Walker is. Uh, yeah, there there is some discussion in the chat that somebody says that the debate in Savannah has been canceled. I am not finding any stories to that effect. Um, I know there were... And this is getting confusing. Um, there were actually two scheduled debates in Savannah, one of which was the originally planned debate that uh, I believe um, that uh, Warnock was w planning to participate in. Um, and then Walker didn't like the format of that debate and arranged for a debate to be hosted by a different outlet that was going to have an audience, I think. Um, and Warnock eventually agreed that he was going to attend that debate. Um, 
So I'm not sure if the debate that's been canceled is the one that wasn't going to have Walker anyway, or uh, if Walker has backed out of the event he already planned on having, Mm -hmm. um, which would seem a little weird. But then again, I mean, I guess, you know, based on what we've been discussing, I mean, I guess, you know, Walker could be trying to avoid that one-on-one confrontation based on what's come out uh, today. But, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, Eli is looking at, you know, we've had some stories like, for example, there was a debate that was scheduled for Macon. Um, but that's one that Walker had never agreed to. Um, there was also, I believe, a debate that was scheduled for either Atlanta or Columbus that um, that Walker, again, had not committed to. So, And then the make it debate was canceled because basically um, Walker wasn't showing up, and apparently they decided that they didn't want to bother with a debate between um, uh, Warnock and the Libertarian candidate, um, which um, I, you know, Personally, I think might have actually been somewhat um, educational to the voters, but apparently um, they did not think that was newsworthy enough. So um, now, if Warnock had also pulled out, I guess you know there's no point in having the debate at that point. But um, but that's a different question. Um, so uh, so we'll, we'll we'll shelve that as um, to be confirmed. Uh, but as of now, uh, I believe the date is October fourteenth. Mm-hmm. Is when it's supposed to be happening, uh, which um, is a debate that's uh, next Friday, I think. Um, and so um, uh, we'll see if that actually happens or not. But as of now, I can't find any stories on uh, the um, Savannah uh, local TV website, that, you know, that was going to be hosting it, or um, or or the Atlanta Journal Constitution, or anywhere else for that matter. They're saying that that. Uh, debate is off. So for now, at least, looks like it's on. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's the the sort of the, the situation that could um, maybe move the needle here where, you know, it's like, okay, I mean, he, so far he's basically faced behind closed doors some friendly audiences. Um, but I think, you know, it's got to be a question that's going to be asked in a debate and how he responds to that is going to be a real challenge. So um, now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to cost him, you know, a quarter of his supporters or anything like that. Right. I think there are a lot of people that are willing to kind of uh, take their lead from um, uh, a lot of the uh, conservative commentators who have in some graphic terms, some even, um, you know, said that basically, well, you know, I mean, the old stereotype is, you know, the, you know, they could kill somebody on stage and they'd still vote for them since they're not a Democrat, right? Um, and, and some of the commentators have gone pretty much that far, right? Basically saying, well, you know, I don't care if he murders babies. Um, he's still not a Democrat. Um, and um, and literally have put it that way. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm not sure it's going to cost him a lot of votes, but the problem is that um, he needs every vote he can get, right? You know, this is not a race where you know, it's it's a gerrymandered district where he can he can pull through if you know if the independents don't vote for it, right? Um, you know, he needs those independent voters, and um, they might not necessarily be as uh, willing to take the lead of uh, Eric Erickson to sort of give him an absolution for this. Um, not to pick on Eric Erickson in particular, but we're gonna pick on Eric Erickson in particular, I guess. Um, so um, let's see. Um, back to our questions. We actually had a couple of questions from the the chat that I was going to ask us to address. So um, um, I do have a we have a question here. Um, who is running this election? I'm not sure if that's a question about who is actually operating the election or who is actually running in the election. Um, yeah, the October thirteenth debate was the one in Macon um, that's been canceled. So that's been, I mean, that was kind of a, a Walking Dead debate for a while now. Anyway, um, just because Warnock was signed up, but uh, Walker wasn't. So, um, so let's see. Uh, do we have anything about this race in particular? I was just kind of scrolling to see if we had anything that would tie in nicely with this. Um, Okay, so we had a question. Um, 
what are your views on having a national voting day holiday where work in non-essential industries is suspended or perhaps mandatory voting? I'll jump on this. Uh, we absolutely should. Absolutely. Should have been done decades ago. I'm a huge proponent. Um, there are no of which? partisan. <laughs> huh? Of Pardon? which? A mandatory voting or, or a day? Oh, so I didn't hear the mandatory. I thought I heard national yeah. voting holiday. Yeah, there. Have been, yeah, the question also mentioned the possibility of mandatory okay. voting like Australia or Brazil or. Gotcha. My apologies, man. Um, national voter holiday. Absolutely. It is an overwhelming oversight on our part as a republic collectively that we do not have a national voter holiday or put it on Saturday. But even that would not be a national voter holiday for people who work on Saturday. So, again, I don't want to offend anyone here. But President's Day. Not to take away from American presidents, but that's the type of holiday we could literally replace. We wouldn't actually have to add a new holiday. So, yes, I think we should have a national voter holiday. Mandatory voting in the United States. I have my personal opinions on that, but constitutionally, and no, I, I can't imagine. Personally, I have different feelings. Um, and I don't mean prison time or jail, much like Australia's mandatory. I believe it's a relatively negligible fine that you would pay, but it has dramatically increased voter turnout. So national voter holiday, absolutely. Mandatory voter law, not in this country. I don't see how that could possibly survive several different constitutional challenges. Matt? Uh, I, I, I agree with John on, on both counts. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, now, on, on a personal level, remember I said that I, I would like people to think about voting as a, as a duty, even though, but the reality is voting is a right. And um, when you talk about a right, it's hard to um, say that, well, this is something you have to do. Uh, because you have, if it's a right, then you have a right to defect. Uh, but on a personal level, I would love it if people were forced to do this. But there's lots of things that I would like people to be forced to do that they're not uh, forced to do. You know, like uh, coming to class, uh, you know, things like that. Just just throwing that out there. I know there's a lot of students in the audience, um, but I understand that at the end of the day, you know, we can't put a gun to your head uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, but no, I, I uh, um, at the the having it as a holiday uh, and, and I do believe I would actually I do want to take a, a one more a, a little bit, maybe a little bit uh, deeper uh, than what uh, Professor Hall said in that. Um, I think you could construct national level legislation um, where you could. Um, have it as a paid holiday for most, at least for government employers, uh, em em employees. You might not be able to push that with the private sector, but as as an a as a um, uh, so. In other words, this is a public school. So in other words, this would be uh, um, we would have um, the school would be closed that day, and um, everybody that worked at this school, um, the expectation would be that they would go out and vote. Uh, and they would get paid for this day because it's a government work. I realize that may not that would be sketchy in the private sector, but the public sector. That's the only thing I would add on to it. I think that that's a reasonable thing that could be done um, in, in 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 for uh, at least for people that work directly in the public sector. Great point, Matt. One quick thing after thinking about it more, I think you could. I think a mandatory voter law could withstand constitutional scrutiny if you look at the Sibelius opinion that upheld the affordable. CARE Act, provided it was considered a tax, uh, then it might actually survive constitutional scrutiny. But again, personally, I think it is beyond a shame if you can vote and choose not to vote. But again, I'm very much iffy on mandatory in the United States. Great questions. Okay, great. Um, so I've been looking and trying to find more stories on the Savannah debate thing. Um, I found a really confused story that said that the story from Macon 
canceling the debate and making them actually meant it was canceled in Savannah. So I don't think they they actually understood the story. Uh, so that might be where some of this confusion is coming from. Um, but uh, like I said, if, I, if we do get any developments that actually do um, affect that, I will let you know, but probably not in the next half hour or so. Um, so we had a question uh, from the chat. Uh, one of our first questions was actually about uh, coattail effects. Um, so uh, I'm going to read this verbatim. I'm not sure how you want to respond to this, but um, does the coattail effect correlate with advertisements of political parties on the Internet? Is it qualified as a tactic for candidates to lure voters to vote for them? Great question. We have not yet in my classes gotten to the coattail effect, but we are a day away. Um, in terms of its impact on Internet advertising by political parties, I'm not sure. I will point out a few things that I am sure of. The coattail effect can be highly overestimated. If you do not have an incredibly popular U.S. president who depending on what definition you look at, is actually running for re-election during the same election as you and you're in the same party. Uh, the coattail effect doesn't even exist um, for the most part. So that's just a quick little precursor to the lesson next week. The coattail effect in general is a reference to a popular president being in an election, you are a U.S. senator or a U.S. representative, even a governor uh in the same party and they come in they visit you air force one lands in your city it's incredibly impressive and you get a bump usually a significant bump um president biden's approval ratings have definitely gone up over the last few weeks a lot of legislative success from the democratic party that's going very much under the radar but i don't think 41 42 percent would necessarily qualify for the coattail effect depending on the state um in terms of its impact on internet advertising i'm not going to entertain a thought there because I don't want to say something that's not well thought out. I don't know how the coattail effect would correlate with advertisements of political parties on the internet. My apologies, but I'm sure Matt does. Well, I, I don't know about all that, but uh, but uh, I, I would say that in terms of uh, of. Um, so so studies of. The coattail effect. Um, have indicated that it does not exist for midterm elections. Uh, that, in fact, if anything, there's a bit of a negative effect. Uh, the, 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 the president's party normally loses seats in the Congress, especially in the House of Representatives. There's been a couple of, uh, a couple of, of years where that didn't happen. Uh, uh, 1934, 1998, uh, 1962 in the Senate. Uh, but overall, so th that's why. That, remember, I said just a bit about the nationalization of these elect midterm elections. Um, in this case, if this is a normal outcome election, the president's party is going to lose lose seats. Now, the the majorities that the Democrats have in the House of Senate are razor thin. So you don't have to lose much to lose control over one or both of those institutions. Right now, um, on if you look on the polling data from projections from Real Clear Politics, they're actually projecting right now that the Republicans will win control over both houses of, of Congress. Um, but uh, it's probably a little early for that, and and real clear as 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 I like them, but they they tend to get a little uh, a little overly excited, in, in my opinion, with with their projections. But um, um, they nonetheless it, it, it now I suppose you could argue in terms of internet advertising with the rise of digital politics. And the, in combined with the nationalization of midterm elections, um, that there might be something there. What that sounds to me like a lot of, though, would be a fascinating research project uh, for uh, for an incoming for a future a graduate student in political science uh, to undertake. It, it's I think that would be an interesting thing to look at because that that digital politics stuff is um, that's kind of that's kind of the new sexy stuff that's out there. So uh, whoever wrote that in there, 
uh, you know, you might you, you you might have a future in the profession. I'm just throwing that out there to you. But. OK, great. Uh, let's see uh, another chat question. Where was my other chat question? Um, Oh, this question's from Ryan. Apologies for not giving credits for other questions before. Um, what do you think people could do to prevent people from voting with a dead person's name? Great question. Uh, this brings up another question I think I saw from Dr. Beek about the possibility of accusations of uh, illegitimate voting. Mm -hmm. This is a, an area that America should have extraordinary pride, and yet we don't. Uh, over half of the Republican Party thinks right now, today, that President Joe Biden did not legitimately win the 2020 election. That is what I would call peculiar. Uh, the American elections, American elections post-progressive era, especially today, are by far some of the absolute most legitimate elections in the history of the world. The, the narrative that we have illegitimate elections is exactly that, it's a narrative. So with that, we'll hit what I like to call anecdotal examples. Great example in the question here, how do we stop dead people from voting? Does that happen? Possibly. Uh, we, we, we think of the classic joke, uh, did, did President Kennedy win the 1960 election with the help of a lot of dead people in New Jersey? It's it's anecdotal um, when you're dealing with millions upon millions of votes. One instance of voter fraud like that will not affect the outcome. But how we generally keep people from using dead people to vote is the felony prosecution that will come afterwards in the decades that you will spend in a federal prison. I don't know anyone who is so dedicated to having some candidate win that they're willing to commit multiple felonies in order to get one, just one extra vote. So does this happen in the history of the Republic? Yes. Is it, is it something that affects electoral outcomes? No. And how would you keep someone from using a dead person to vote? You're going to have to get through a lot of gatekeepers to successfully use a dead person to vote. Um, you're going to have to have access to someone who very recently died, definitely after the last election. Um, while it does have extreme disadvantages, bordering on voter suppression, the extremely aggressive manner in which Georgia, for example, purges our voter rolls is in many ways to prevent things of this nature. In other words, how do we stop that? First, recognize that it does not happen on a grand scale. Secondly, it's a felony. And third, there are a number of mechanisms uh, underneath the Secretary of State, the Secretaries of State of all 50 states that prevent that. There are uh, federal, state, and local entities that investigate examples of voter fraud like that. Great question. Again, to summarize, it just doesn't happen a lot. And if it does, you're committing a felony and you're probably going to spend a long amount of time in a federal prison. You have to remember that, again, post-progressive era, if you go pre-progressive era, American elections were hilariously corrupt. Uh, political parties used to print ballots and count ballots. Post-progressive era, we have an incredibly clean electoral system. It's also unimaginably decentralized. We have 50 different states who are nominally in charge of elections. Again, to my students, Georgia is in charge of voting in Georgia. But even then, it's further decentralized at the precinct level. Anyone here who has gone to vote knows what you see when you go to vote. You see your old high school football coach. You see your grandmother over there volunteering. The thought of having a systemic corrupt system the way we run elections is literally impossible i fear that i'm going off on too many different tangents here this is an area that i'm passionate about american elections are shockingly clean and very legitimate we should be proud of them how do we stop dead people from voting a recognize that they don't in any way that would matter and two it's a felony you're going to get caught you're going to go to federal prison on that note i'll hand it over to matter Oh, I don't think there really needs to be a, a, any more uh, said on it, it, it uh, other than uh, I, I will say so uh, 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 before the. The. Um, across the country, the 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 the, the recent wave of, of electoral reforms. Um, that, of course, one side uh, claims it are, are uh, suppressive actions. 
but when you when you require people to have photo ID and stuff like that uh, to register, and when you require them to have photo ID to actually show up and vote as they do in so many states, um, uh, the ability to it really retards the ability uh, to um, you know to have zombies uh, uh, voting. Um, as thrilling as that might be, but um, uh, ha has it ever happened that? Uh, well, sure, it's, it's happened. Uh, 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 lots, lots of things happen. It used to happen on a fairly regular basis uh, in the old age of machine politics, uh, but those those times are um, um, very far in in our past now. And uh, um, one thing that that people should should uh, actually be quite proud of. Um, is really the stability of American elections, uh, particularly in the last hundred years, hundred and twenty years. They've been they've really been stellar, and we've been a um, a beacon to the world really on it. Um, now, if you go to certain other countries, it's a crapshoot as to whether or not the election is legitimate. But uh, but uh, in, in America, uh, we 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 we've tend to do a pretty good job uh, on it overall. Great point, Matt. Just to reiterate what you said, uh, our elections are very legitimate, extremely clean claims to the contrary, claims that legitimate elections and election results, claims that they are illegitimate, are dangerous and irresponsible. And they are made 100% of the time by people who A, do not know what they're talking about, or B, people who very much know what they're talking about, and I don't know which one's more dangerous. Yeah, yeah uh, the other thing I, I would add is, you know, when, when there are cases of it, usually it's impersonation fraud by relatives. Um, more than anything else, that tends to be the most common thing where, you know, a spouse will mail in their spouse's ballot, oftentimes when they've died or something like that. Or, um, or you know, I, I've heard of cases where, you know, people will vote for their children or that sort of thing. Um but again, you know, the, the cases are fairly isolated. People tend to get caught and um, usually get, they get the book thrown at them when they are caught. Um, so, you know, the the risk reward ratio is not very good, um, you know, particularly when you start to think through the the process. It's not like you can just sort of smuggle in a bunch of ballots and stick them in the, the machine and nobody's going to notice. Right. You know, there are audits. There's. Um, you know, the, the poll book, you know, the number of people that sign into the poll book is counted and uh, that is uh, cross-checked with the number of votes there are and that sort of thing. If there are discrepancies, you know, even if there's a discrepancy of one or two, you know, people will go th have to go back through and investigate that. You know, one, um, one kind of useful thing and one thing you might want to consider as a student actually is – um, you know, anybody that's worked at the polls knows that it's uh, um, there's a very intricate uh, and laid out process to make sure that, you know, things don't slip through the cracks like that. And um, as a young person, um, you know, they're always looking for young people to volunteer to, to work at the polls. Um, and you can find out more information about that on the Secretary of State's website as well. I'm not sure if they're still recruiting people for this election, but um, but if you've got time on election day or some of that, it might be something you might want to consider. It's a very educational experience. Um, I, you know, when I, I spent about a year, uh, when I lived in another community in New Orleans, uh, you know, uh, working at the polls and learned a lot about elections that way, just from uh, the experience of, you know, seeing it firsthand and seeing what, you know, what goes into it and uh, how seriously poll workers take their jobs and um, that sort of thing. So it can be a very uh, valuable thing to know, um, whether you're a political scientist or just an ordinary citizen for that matter. Um, let's see. So let's, um, we are down to our last uh 15 minutes or so. So I do want to get to our other big uh, race, skip ahead a little bit and talk about um, the other marquee contest in Georgia is our big rematch uh, between uh, Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams, who faced off before 2018. Um, and so, you know, it seems like a rerun, but at the same time, uh, you know, things may be different this time around. Or what, what is the same from last time around beyond just who the candidates are? And what's different between you know, what, what's changed in the last four years that might make this election turn out a bit differently or maybe turn out the same for that matter? Great question. 
Uh, the gubernatorial election in Georgia is one that the nation will be watching. Uh, many potential firsts. If uh, Stacey Abrams were elected, she would be the first African American governor of the state of Georgia. Also, the first female governor of the state of Georgia. Um, the 2018 election was incredibly close. Uh, it uh, did go to a recount. Uh, it did actually take um, then candidate Abrams uh, several weeks before conceding the loss because it was so close. There was some controversy at the time. Governor now Governor Kemp was the Secretary of State. And for any students out there, the Secretary of State of a state is very different than the Secretary of State at the federal level. They're predominantly in control of elections and the administration of elections. So a lot of controversy there with that title election. Now we have another title election. What's different? Well, let's look at what we have now. The last data I have seen has an incredibly tight election right now with Forgive me, I should have had this already pulled up. I believe that Governor Kemp has about a two point lead over. I've seen three points. I've seen four points. I've seen one point. Stacey Abrams is losing right now. If the election were held today, uh, she's suffering from a three to four, depending on the poll point deficit. Having said that, um, Stacey Abrams has shown in the past an extraordinary ability to invigorate the Democratic base to actively go out and encourage the registration of voters who have not been registered. When it comes to doubting Stacey Abrams' ability on election day, that's a dangerous bet to make. Having said that, what's changed? This is still Georgia. Well, we've had two U.S. senators from the state of Georgia wearing Democratic uh, lapels that have been elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, does that mean that the state of Georgia is blue? Absolutely not, but that's a major event. We also have um, current Senator Raphael Warnock, who will be running for re-election. Not necessarily the definition of coattail, but it could be something there. If you have Warnock voters who are going out specifically to vote for Senator Warnock, I'm sure they would vote for Stacey Abrams. Also, between the 2018 and 2022 election, um, there have been about 1.5 million new registered Georgia voters added to the rolls from um from migration from other states into the state of Georgia. Georgia has one of the most powerful and growing economies on the planet. This is a great place to live. If anyone's from Georgia, it's a good, it's a phenomenal state. There are a lot of new voters that were not uh, voting in 2018. Having said that, with regard to their policies, um, Stacey Abrams is a Democrat, Governor Kemp is a Republican, so the national party platforms of both of those parties are relatively well represented there. Uh, Governor Kemp has advantages that he didn't have in 2018. He's the incumbent. Um, he has won over an extraordinary amount of support from the Republican base. He's won over Democrats. He also had the rare opportunity to take on then President Donald Trump as a Republican. And he confronted President Trump when asked some might interpret this to be a possible attempt at electoral fraud when he was asked by, Gov by President Trump to find, you know, thousands of votes for President Trump. He actually, this is, I'm talking about the Secretary of State Raffensperger here, but Governor Kemp stood up to President Trump when Tr President Trump was putting pressure on Governor Kemp. That also won him the respect of many centrist Democrats. Having said that, this is a tight election. Stacey Abrams is trailing and has been trailing. Both candidates are strong candidates. One thing to, to keep in mind is that when polled, I think it was 98% of Republicans in Georgia are planning on voting for Governor Kemp. 97% of Democrats when polled in Georgia are planning on voting for Stacey Abrams. These are two candidates who have seized the base. This is a battle of the bases. This is Democrat versus Republican. There is not a lot of wiggle room between registered Democrats and registered Republicans. This will be won by independents in the middle that we are not talking about. On that note, because I can keep going forever, I will stop and hand it over to Matt. All right, that was great. Um, yeah, the, uh, so what what has what I think a, a main thing that is one main thing that has changed is that we had to fall out from the 2020 election between 18 and 22. And I think we're going to see what we're going to possibly see an impact on that 
again, I keep kind of going back to this nationalization of, of these midterm elections, but I think it's very important here in Georgia. Um, uh, I think it's uh, that we got an early run of maybe something we're going to see in 24. And um, uh, I don't know at the end of the day uh, which one of these two is, is actually going to win. If, if you if you run the trend line and you, you look at the trend analysis over time, um, it seems to favor the governor. Uh, but the problem is, as uh, as Professor Hall has pointed out, the, num- the margin is so small that all you need is a, a slight a slight change in turnout rates, a slight movement of independence, uh, a small defection. I mean, a half a percent could could lead to a different differential outcome. Uh, um, so this will be interesting to watch. Now, maybe we got what do we got about a month to go here. Uh, we might have one of them might overtake the other and and get a significant uh, lift uh, that that's possible. But I, I my thought would be that um, if that was going to happen, it would have happened already, and it hasn't happened. So I think we're going to, I think we're going down to the wire, just like we did four years ago. Um, Governor, um, Governor Kemp has advantages um, from, uh, that was pointed out by, by John, but, uh, but there's also some disadvantages that he has that, uh, which is sort of the other side that, you know, he didn't back uh, he didn't back the big dog uh, in in 20. Uh, and that might cause a small defection on that side. And understand something, that's all, that's all Ms. Abrams would need uh, potentially to get over the line. Uh, the other thing that's out there is that, um, which could be a, um, um, uh, somewhat of a uh, of a help to Kemp, uh, to Governor Kemp, as as a fallout uh, among uh, disaffection with some of the uh, um, uh, the more uh, extreme civil rights, some of the activities that led to some of the um, uh, some of the violent protests and stuff uh, that could actually hurt. That could that could help. Governor Kemp and and actually depress um, um, a chance for for Ms. Abrams uh, on that. But uh, so those I see some advantages for for Kemp within that. Um, now on the on the Abrams side, as uh, as as John has pointed out, she is a voting registering machine. Uh, she has uh, probably been more responsible uh, as a single person. For really some of the Democratic Party's nationwide level success um, in in the in the in the uh, the 2018 to 2020 period, uh, and she's a major player. I'll even say this: that even if she loses this election, um, uh, I don't think she's going anywhere. I think she's uh, she's going to be a major player. She may not always be a politician, but she's going to be a major player. Uh, in the Democratic Party for dem- decades to come, uh, Governor Kemp, uh, if he wins re-election, uh, whether whether that is his last office or not, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know if he'll have the gravitas to to move forward beyond a second term as governor. He may, uh, or he might just be, you know, a, a Nathan Deal or somebody like that. Uh, but anyway, so I've be I think I've belabored a bit too much on this topic already. So I'm going to shut up. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, So uh, one last uh, question. I think it's appropriate. We'll take someone from the chat. Uh, uh, So Eli has a question for us. Um, Do we think that Georgia going blue in the 2020 presidential election is indicative of a larger trend towards realignment in Georgia? Good political science word there, realignment. I like that. Do I think this is a critical realignment occurring in Georgia? No. Um, the election, the electoral outcomes were so razor thin. If uh, Senator Warnock were to win by a landslide and Stacey Abrams were to win by a landslide, then I would start to think possibly because those are the two statewide elections that we are talking about tonight. There are, of course, more than that in terms of statewide elections that we haven't had the chance to get to. But 
is this a realignment of the state of Georgia? I'm assuming you mean, Eli, to a blue state. We'll know after this election. If this is a realignment to a blue state status for Georgia, Senator Warnock and Stacey Abrams win their respective elections significantly. That would be literally a sign of a realignment. If it's razor thin again, then no. Purple, I think purple is the uh, status of Georgia now and into the future. Great question. That's the best way I can answer it. Uh, I just jump jump in on, on that. That is a great question. And um, realignment issues always fascinate me personally. But um, so there was a um, one of the great political scientists, and he kind of cut his teeth on the study of Southern politics, but his name was V.O. Key. He's long passed away. But V.O. Key came up with a contribution to the realignment academic literature. He came up with a notion of something he called a secular realignment, which was that a, a over a period of elections, you could see a change in um, the distribution of political party power, about which party was in power. And what we could have, is uh, I think that he's pulling out the VO keys, uh, Southern, there it is, there it is, Southern politics of state nation. There's the man right there, VO key. Uh, the, um, uh, you could, what we could be seeing going on here in, uh, uh, in, um, in Georgia is we could, we, we might be able to say that we have some initial evidence supporting maybe a secular realignment, not necessarily to becoming um, a full blown uh, blue state, uh, blue state, but a a secular realignment away from being red state Republican to being as as John pointed out here, purple state, um, two party competitive. Which, as I told my students in 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 my classes today, uh, that means that in twenty four again, I keep going about this nationalization thing. In twenty four, uh, it looks to me like we here in Georgia we're going to be major players. We're going to get so tired of seeing the Democratic and the Republican parties. We'll be ready to scream because um, we're a big state. We got 10 million people. And it looks to me, if there's anything to be OK, secular realignment here, we're moving in the direction of being a two party competitive so-called purple state, which would mean that we're going to we're going to be players in a way in, the pre in national politics. That quite frankly, we haven't been for decades because for decades, you know, way back in the day, actually, when V.O. Key was writing, Georgia was uh, was a Southern Democratic state. And that's what it was. I mean, that's. Uh, and then with the kind of uh, if we want to go with Key, a secular realignment of the South towards the Republican Party, Georgia became a solidly red state uh, Republican uh, Party. In fact, in the last present series of presidential elections dating back some decades now the democrats only won twice in the state that was bill clinton in 92 and joe biden in 20 uh but it looks to me if i'm correct on this which maybe i am maybe i'm not i think we might be moving clearly in this direction i think the closeness between all these elections really shows that i mean there was a time you know if not that many years ago, I mean, Herschel Walker as the Republican candidate, I mean, especially, you know, he's Mr. Go, Go Dogs, you know, UGA guy. I mean, uh, there was a time in Georgia politics not that long ago. I mean, he'd be he'd be he'd be running down the field like just like he used to do with the football. Um, uh, he'd be running away with this thing. And we'd be asking about Raphael, who who's a who's a Warnock. But. The fact that it's tight like that, I think, is some evidence, some significant evidence to show how we have moved in this, um, I'll call from VO Kia secular realignment. So anyway, I think that's enough of me. Yibber -yabber. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would add to that is, you know, Georgia has been sort of an odd state in realignment in general, right? It was one of the last states really to go through the realignment from Democrats to Republicans, right? You you know, you still had, uh, you know, Democrats winning, you know, well into the, the 1990s, right? Um, you know, 
Georgia is one of the few states that uh, uh, Bill Clinton won in the South, right? Um, and then, um, and then of course, you know, it had kind of this red wall almost in the 2000s and 2010s, and now it's kind of gone back the other way, right? And so, um, and you've got two kind of intersecting trends here, right? It, it, it is a contest between them, right? On the one hand, you have this demographic trend towards more diversity, right, in the state. Um, and diversity, um, you know, becoming more um, of a, um, you know, just a, a critical factor, right? But at the same time, you have, um, so you would expect that to them, you know, favor the Democrats, but, but the Democrats are also, or the, that diversity is also becoming less solidly democratic, um, you know, and, you know, you could, you know, there was a time when you could count for, you know, um, that uh, black voters were going to go 90% for the Democrats, and it's no longer the case, right? It's not, you know, it's not 50-50, it's not 60-40, it's not even 70-30, but, um, but it's not 90-10 or 95 like it was before, right? Um, and so while, um, you know, if, if the trends had stayed the same with, you know, the, the monolithic African-American vote for Democrats, um, you know, Abrams, Warnock would be able to win with 25% of the white vote, right? Well, um, that number starts creeping up, right? You know, in the last election, it was something like 30% uh, of the white vote was going for um, Democrats, and that was barely enough, right? Um, and so, um, or not enough, right? And so, um, as as and also we're getting into minorities that aren't 90 90 10 right you're getting you know um uh, asian americans are not as monolithically democratic um uh hispanics are not as monolithically democratic and so um you know and particularly you know donald trump has has gotten some real inroads with hispanic voters um uh for reasons that a lot of people find very difficult to fathom but nonetheless it's happening right um and so um, that so the so is Democrat is Georgia going to become a blue state? I would say no. Um, is Georgia going to stay a competitive state? I would say probably, um, just because it's kind of almost a self fulfilling prophecy. You know, you get all this attention from politicians, and it's going to stay competitive, right? Until until at some level it isn't right until and until it's not worth their money anymore until it's not worth their time anymore and um for now at least it doesn't seem like that's going to change um but um uh, we have gone uh, a little bit over um and uh while we've got lots of other questions i could ask um i think this is you know, we've been here for an hour and 35 minutes or so, so I think that's a fairly good point for us to adjourn. It also leaves us with a lot more things we can talk about after the election as well. Um, so much, I mean, certainly we'll do some post-mortem as well. Um, but uh, before we adjourn, just want to uh, give you a couple of reminders, announcements, that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to have another discussion event coming up in a couple of weeks on Monday the 17th. So a week from Monday, uh, a little bit earlier in the week. Um, we're going to have our dis a discussion event, updating events in Ukraine. Um, so an international politics discussion. Um, you know, that's been obviously a lot in the news lately, particularly as uh, Ukraine has gone on its fall offensive, if you will. Um, and things are uh, rapidly changing there. And so I, I will not even try to predict what we're going to be talking about in uh, 12 days uh, or whatever it's going to be. Um, I guess it will be 12 days, um, but uh, it will definitely be something. I can tell you that. Um, and then our final discussion event, uh, we're planning on doing that after the election uh, sometime. I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, um, but um, uh, unfortunately, the, the way things are scheduled, uh, the election was on the 8th. Uh, we have the Georgia Political Science Association conference later that week, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to try to put in that um, discussion event later on that week because there may be people. I know John is going to be a GPSA. I might be a GPSA. I don't know about Matt, um, but um, um, we will. Uh, so we're going to have to have that the following week, uh, which I think is the. Oh, I can't tell you what the date is off the top of my head like the 16th or something like that I think is what I put down. Um, but um, but we'll have announcements and things like that posted. And of course, there'll be um, uh, 
the slides and all that stuff in our lobby and things like that. So um, before we adjourn, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Caverly, uh, Matt Caverly and Dr. John Hall for their joining us, as well as thanking uh, Dr. Beek for his introduction and uh, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Matchock and uh, Dr. Slavic for joining us as well. Um, if you want to watch this again for some reason, we'll have that posted to YouTube later on. Um, it takes a while for it to upload and stuff, so I probably won't have it posted today, but um, uh, keep an eye out for it uh, next week. Um, the uh, websites for getting registered to vote and uh, finding voter registration information in other states are posted in the chat, so you may want to scroll through those, um, or you can just email us. We'd be happy to share those. And uh, thank you again, and I hope everybody has a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, John. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for everybody for coming. Have a great evening. Thanks, you too. Yeah, have a good one. We will uh, stop recording.